All right, so let's take a look at UFC 293 from this past weekend in Australia. Maybe not the biggest upset in UFC history in terms of result, but the biggest upset, I think, in terms of how the fight went, where a giant underdog, I saw as crazy as he was plus 650, yeah, plus 700, was, Sean Strickland. It was crazy. Not only beat Israel Adesanya, he came in and he dominated him for five rounds. It was honestly one of the most surprising uh, fights I've ever witnessed. And it's one of the reasons you got to love MMA because no matter what everything says on paper, sometimes it's as simple as two guys fighting and whoever has it on that night. And Sean Strickland had it on. Izzy did not. And we saw damn near a master class, honestly. Yeah, I have to agree. We, we talked about this heavily. I... Before actually locking in our picks, I told you that, you know, I was toying with it. I didn't know what to do. I do give you credit. You did say it. But I also said that I was going to stop doubting myself and I was going to continue to, you know, like kind of go with what I felt. And then I went against it anyway. Um, so, you know, that's all all against me. Sean Strickland, like you said, had a completely dominant showing. He walked Izzy down for five straight rounds. I honestly think the fight was more or less over after he knocked Izzy down. That first round knockdown, right at the end of the round. I think he got 26, 27 con consecutive punches to the head damn near in a row. Right, even if they weren't wildly connecting, of course, you know, that's... A couple of them did, that's why he dropped. Correct, exactly. Not everything has to connect for for all of that damage to I mean, Izzy's up. lucky he didn't go out with, the, with that right hand he hit him with. You're absolutely right. No, it was definitely a great showing by Sean Strickland. Obviously, well-deserved the belt. He won judges' scorecards 49-46 uh, by all the judges, which, you know, that's... I agree with four rounds to one. Right. Very dominant showing. Um, he had a very strong front kick that kept Adesanya at bay. He had, like we said, the knockdown, significant he just, damage. He kept walking Adesanya down, and what Adesanya's best at is counter-striking. But when you're running that, but he was, that hard... He was going... He was backpedaling the entire time, and Sean Strickland wasn't overly aggressive. Where he, it was almost like he didn't have anything to counter strike. Right. He, but wasn't, he was giving him pressure. Right. The feints. So in the first round, the feints really kind of had Sean on edge, but then he settled in. And to your point, well, he the, said in his press conference a couple times as he hit him, and he was like, "I could tell then he didn't have it." Like in the first round, where he's like, it. he didn't have, I, I, he didn't have his full power is what he was kind of alluding to. But he could tell, like, that wasn't the night for him. And from there, I mean, Sean Strickland, it was just, as I said, one of the most surprising, honestly, performances we've ever seen. Yeah, it was impressive. So a couple questions for you, just real quick. Do you think, I know Dana Dana said he wanted a rematch it, uh, immediately. I don't Do want the immediate rematch. I don't think in a fight, despite how great of a champion Izzy has been, worth a dominant uh, performance. I don't think you deserve a immediate title shot after you get dominated. So do you give it to Drakus? Do you give it to Kismot? Who, who do you give it to? I would like to see Drakus Duplessis get the uh, title shot, but I also would not be upset if the winner of Paulo Costa, Hamzat Shamayev, coming up in a couple weeks, if that, that winner gets a title shot. So I think those are the two options are, again, if you do the rematch, Izzy. So I think three options, solid options for his first title defense. Cool. I dig it. So in a heavyweight matchup, we saw Ty Bam Bam Tuivasa take on Alexander Drago Volkov. Uh, this, honestly, I felt as though we were going to get a knockout. This was a very Drago performance from Volkov. It, it was kind of crazy. Um, obviously, Ty Tuivasa being the smaller guy coming in. Drago Volkov, not Drakov. Volkov is a six foot seven monster yeah. of a guy. That giant dude. Tuivas is 6'2. He's not a small guy by any standard, but in comparison, that's nuts. Um, plus six reach advantage there. Honestly, Tuivas's best game plan was what kind of he leaned on was getting those leg kicks, that leg damage early. He got it off in the first round. Volkov did drop him uh, in the first and then finish it up in the second with a rare Ezekiel choke after uh, landing a. A few clean, perfect shots against Tuivasa. Honestly, it's hard to fight against that kind of reach. In a heavyweight fight, you know, with Volkov beating Tuivasa, they were like, what, five and six ranked 
heavyweight, something like that. Yeah, both top ten. I mean, you just gotta assume Volkov's making his. I guess what what I would say is his final run for a belt. Yeah, for sure. He just came in and, as you said, Tuivasa's game plan clear, leg kicks, and he was landing them and they were working. But Volkov just in the end kind of ate ate him. He relied on being a precision sniper from the outside. He got him with the. You said he dropped him in the first. Yeah, he then dropped him again in the second, and that's what led to his ground control and eventually, to as you said, the rare Ezekiel choke. I'd like to point out a, uh, you know, a weird or not a weird comparison, but a comparison. You know, looking at that, it's kind of looking at like DC versus John Jones with the size difference. It's like wild DC is you know a powerful striker. He was you know a great wrestler. Keeping him at bay was was John Jones's you know best attribute in all of those yeah, fights. Reach goes a long way, and this was a, as I said alluded to earlier, a very Drago performance, just in the way he kind of he ate damage. Right, just said he's all right getting hit. Now and then had the kill shot, I for, guess kill choke. Yeah, kill the Ezekiel choke, if you will. No, not if you will. That's exactly what it's called. Uh, so, what do you think's next for Volkov? I think Volkov. What is he should be a, a top five opponent next. I think he's. I don't think he's a title shot guy right now. Marcin Tibera, maybe. Tibera would be a good one. Whoever doesn't fight in the like uh, Pavlovov, right? Uh, Gone uh, Aspinall triangle. Whoever right. doesn't get the fight in that triangle, maybe. Or whoever loses. Or whoever loses one of those guys. Uh, Volkov, as you said, I think he's getting up in age a little bit. I think this is his. Uh, his last kind of push for a legitimate title shot. And it's interesting to see, you know, the uh, a very crowded heavyweight rankings at this point. Yeah, you don't always see it. It's nice to see, though, especially in the UFC. Usually there's a couple guys that are just way dominant. Right. Yeah, like, the, you've always had the John Jones. You've always had the, you know, the Cyril Gon making a big name. The Derek Lewis, you know, having those big knockouts. Yeah, but, but it's been few and far between for, you know, like crazy, you know, contention. Yeah, now usually, I think we have the time. You usually don't have them all at the same time. Usually there's a couple every now and then. Now it seems like we have four, five, six legitimate like title shot guys in the heavyweight division currently, which is nice to see. Heavyweight division is always going to be the one that I think interests the most people just because these guys are just throwing bombs. Right, and that was actually what I was about to say is a lot of those fights are going to be you know inside the first round, inside of two rounds. You don't have to look at championship rounds when you're fighting with 265-pound guys. All right, so the next fight we're covering is Manil Cop, Felipe Dos Santos. It was a, I don't want to say dominant, but an obvious Manil Cop win in this fight. He definitely won the fight. He performed well. wasn't a bad showing. But somehow, and I can't explain why, he was overshadowed by Felipe Dos Santos only because of Dos Santos' resolve and resilience and refusal to quit. Because he had some, he was getting beat up a little bit out there. But the way he was able to stand in, deliver his own shots, and he was there the entire time, it was an impressive performance by, by him, the UFC debutant, and he proved he belongs in the UFC, I think, despite the loss. I wholeheartedly agree. Um, Dos Santos got dropped in the first round, but he didn't give up, as you said. Uh, he faced a lot of adversity and a you know top 15 opponent in Manel Cop. He has traditionally just been a, you know, pretty good fighter in the UFC. He's 18 and 6, I believe, is his overall record. Um, listen, Cop put on a... It's four wins in a row from, from Cop, too. Cop put on an per- impressive performance. Yeah, Striking again. performance, great. He got efficient takedowns. All of that led to the unanimous decision. But you were absolutely right. Like I said, Dos Santos, he fought through the adversity... He showed resilience, determination. I'm excited to see, you know, the career starting for Felipe Dos Santos. But also, congratulations to Manel Cop, your unanimous decision victory. I think he gets a top five opponent next. I think he's one, maybe two wins away. If he gets two big wins in a row, he could be knocking at the door for a title shot. Man, and he is a shit talker, huh? He's a shit talker. He dropped uh, what was the second f-bomb new age f-bomb of interviews which right. was crazy you don't hear that very often right and, and just just so you're aware that word is um a synonym not a synonym sorry it is uh it's rhyming with the french word for bread 
a baguette. Yeah, I don't think we need any more context than that, Alex. Thank you, though. But Manil Kopp, he talks shit. He can probably drive some pay-per-views. So he's a guy that could, you know, you could see him getting a title shot soon. Justin Taffa rematched Austin Lane uh, from a no contest, my only betting no contest, our only betting no contest since we've started. Um, that was from, actually the first event we ever did to UFC Jacksonville in July. It was crazy. Well, like UFC Jacksonville, wow, so long ago. And now they're rematching. So they they already Austin Lane already lost. Um, this fight opened up with a another accidental eye poke from Austin Lane. Yeah, at that point, that's ridiculous. It was. Crazy. I know it was accidental this time. Or it was accidental both times, but. That's got to be your number one thing going into the fight. Like, I can't poke this guy in the eye again. And right away, it happened. Right. And they, it kind of pissed Taf off. I think so. They, the whole fight, uh, the two fighters threw a combined 29 strikes. Um, and I think Taffa after... Taffa the ones that counted. He did. Besides the eye poke, I guess that counts as a strike. Yeah, even... It was accidental, but yeah, it does count as a strike. Uh, so Taffa, honestly, I think after recovering from the eye poke, he decided enough was enough. He saw his opportunity to strike. He didn't want to be blind for the rest of his life. Right. He wanted to fight, like, again, ever. Yeah. He's like, all right, that's enough. That's enough. He decided he's not going to, like, let Austin Lane make the mistakes anymore. And he finished with a clean hand, dropping Austin Lane to the canvas, following it up with some devastating ground and pound, forcing the referee to interfere, awarding the TKO for the Taffa gang. Yeah, Justin Taffa does what every Taffa does did does did does did do right whatever they do that's what he did there you go there we go whatever he they came do, in he got a vicious knockout uh press performance in front of the home crowd it was great to see exciting to see probably the best even though i'd probably say it's the best knockout of the or like tko of the night it was definitely the most interesting exactly all right, so the next fight we're taking a look at was Tyson Pedro versus Anton. You're going to have to help me with this last name. How do you say it? Turkaj? Turkaj, I can say that. Turkaj, Pedro, this was a classic case of a guy with a lot of UFC experience. Although it's not the most successful, he's 5-4. and four. This was his 10th fight in Tyson Pedro. He was taking on a guy, yes, making his third fight, but he's 0-2 in the UFC, so he hasn't really proved if he... Kind of has what it takes to stick around. Has what it takes to stick around, exactly. And Pedro, he proved experience is key in a lot of these fights. Not every time, but when it's a lot versus a little, the experience uh, was in his favor. He came in. He got the first round knockout. He proved that there's that Turkaj was not on his level at all. Right. Yeah, a lot of times watching from home, uh, fans, at least I, get not, not really agitated, but, you know, I'm like, come on, like, Go for the finish whenever you see the the damage doing damage. Like, yeah, don't just hesitate. But you guys, all you also got to understand the right. I'm not the one fighting. Yeah, and like Pedro, I don't want to go to the ground. Right, Pedro, Tyson Pedro, he did not hesitate. No, he, he did what every saw, fan's yelling about. Right, he saw the damage doing damage. He saw the strikes making impact, and he decided after you know the first one kind of the first one two combo kind of drum dropped. Turkaj, he followed up later in the round with another one-two combo, dropping him and then sealing the deal for his, you know, KO victory. Yeah, it was a beautiful performance. Again, it proved the experience played a factor. Uh, they're not on the same level, but great win by Tyson Pedro. Carlos Carlos Alberg took on Dawoon Jung in a predominantly striking matchup that, honestly, it was pretty similar to the last fight with Tyson Pedro versus Anton Turkaj. Um, this one almost went to the judges' scorecard. And throughout, Olberg did, you know, consistent damage. He led with his jab. He yeah, dodged. He was, he was very patient. He dodged. He was almost too patient where you feel like he could, if he would have pressed a little bit more, he could have got the finish earlier. But he was in total control the entire fight, pretty much. Right. He led the narrative. Uh, he dodged Good way to all put the it, attacks. led the narrative. Yeah, dodge all the like didn't dodge everything, but dodges the most powerful attacks of Jung, which is obviously the most important point point. And in the last moments of the last round, he got his opponent's back, locking in the rear naked choke, grabbing the first submission victory of his career, which is 
you know, some fighters never go for that. Some fighters always strive for it and just kind of never get it's the It's good opposition. to have in your arsenal, though. Just so right. the, the other ability. guy knows now he has that. That's five straight wins for Olberg, four straight finishes. Uh, so he's the guy rising up in the rankings uh, pretty soon. If he gets a couple more wins in a row, he might be a guy cracking the at least top 15, maybe even top 10. He's exciting to watch. A great prospect. Unfortunately, Jung... This is his third straight loss, so we'll see where he goes from here. Uh, he's kind of hit a snag as of late. Yeah, I hope to not be talking about him on the first week of October in split decision because that is the roster watch. All right, so the next fight we're going to talk about, probably the most gruesome fight of the night. Not even probably. It is the most gruesome. It's the most gruesome fight in a few fight cards. This was Jack Jenkins, Jose Mariscal, ended with, I guess you would describe it as a elbow dislocation by jack jenkins he just fucked his elbow up a whole bunch yeah i saw a video of him today on social media uh he was talking about it was an, a full elbow dislocation in the second round it was gross he honestly the way he laid there after it happened and the way they stopped the fight i that thought he broke gave his us, neck that gave us the worst feeling after because so well, let's break down the fight a little bit He laid bit there like a dead body. I he thought did. he broke his neck and he was dead. He did, but it, it was terrifying. So Thank God he's all right, by the way. The first round, Jenkins kind of led on the scorecard. It was a contested contested round, kind of had a bunch of jabs, kicks, you know, fighters trying to find their rhythm. And then you go to the second, you know, didn't really get a lot going in the whole fight. You know, like I said, fighters trying to find rhythm. Uh, machine gun Mariscal tried to throw Jenkins. Chepe. I in that by. throw, yeah, it, it's kind of hard to get a handle on what he wants to be called. Is it Jose, Chepe, Machine Gun? I'm going to call him Mariscal because that's his last name. Um, he tries to throw Jenkins. Jenkins tries to catch himself. And that's when the dislocation happens. And what you said, kind of face plant, full death, uh, Grand Theft Auto wasted moment, if you will. Yeah, it was scary. It did not. It, it's not anything we're happy or excited to to talk about. Those, those are gruesome moments. And this was a fight. It was between two guys, kind of like with promising starts to their UFC career. One guy two and zero in Jenkins, although he's he's kind of gotten some popularity as of late. Mariscal again one and zero, five straight wins. So there's two guys with their careers going in the upward trajectory. So you hate to see this happen, where he's going to be out probably for a while, Jack Jenkins. But five straight wins for Mariscal, 2-0 and in the UFC. He's climbing the ladder. Oh. He's going to put this on his resume. One good bit of good it. news. One good bit of one bit of good news. There you go. There we go. There, there we, we go. go. Yeah, see, we both fuck up. Uh, Jenkins got an x-ray. No broken bones. He just has to get an MRI to see if there's any ligament damage. So it could be a shorter uh, recovery time than you know we initially thought based on the, the KO. Two lightweights, John Magdessi versus the Australian native, Jamie Malarkey. That dude's got a busted face. Yeah, and it got busted a little bit in this fight, too. It did. Um, Jamie Malarkey won a close decision here, 29-28, yeah, unanimous, I, think it, I, I will say. I think it could have gone either way. I think we both had it in Malarkey's favor, 29-28. Which, if you ask me, because I picked malarkey pre-fight i'm gonna say the judges got it wholeheartedly correct exactly i'm all with the judges on this fight a good competitive fight but it looked like malarkey had the slight edge um uh, so yeah i'm not upset with that decision at all right it was like you said contested close back and forth malarkey focused on his jab delivered a lot of leg kicks he was feeding off the crowd it seemed like too the crowd was heavily in his favor man a home crowd i i, I couldn't imagine especially playing in a for place a where they don't have uh, events a lot like australia where it's like twice a year so every time right they're coming out in full force and it's a a, a pay-per-view event on top of it it's not just a normal fight night so it adds that extra layer of authenticity and you know just kind of like i have to be there the crowd was amazing in this fight for all the home fighters except for israel adesanya for some reason neither fighter scored a takedown now, i don't think that's what they were uh you know wholeheartedly going for it was a big striking contest you know, trying to finish the fight. Jamie Malarkey won. He's a good fighter. Uh, Magdessi's a great fighter as well. You know, lightweight, we've always said, is just like probably, in my opinion, the toughest division to make it in the UFC. Yeah, they've so, both been around for a while too. Mag uh, Malarkey, that moves into five and four in the UFC. So he's the guy that he keeps winning and losing. 
Maybe he can go on a little run here, get a couple wins in a row. Malarkey, he's been in the, he's fought even more in the UFC. He moves to 11 and nine. That was his 20th UFC fight. So he's been around. Uh, we'll see where each guy goes from here. But it was an entertaining fight. But the home guy got it done in the end. All right, so the last fight we're going to cover is Nazrat Hakparast taking on Landon Quinones. And this was a case of a guy making his debut versus a guy, as we alluded to earlier, with more experience, how that plays a factor. Right. It seems like the experience played a factor in this. It was a solid win. Unanimous, unanimous decision, 30-27, all three judges for Hakparast. Uh, he put on a good performance, but Quinones, props to him, great toughness. Dude, this one was crazy. It was, like you said, unanimous decision to hack Paras, but kind of slept on to the fact that s over 700 total strikes were thrown in this fight. Yeah, there was a there was two guys throwing some strikes. Quinonez in his UFC debut, kind of similar to Felipe Dos Santos in his UFC debut, in my opinion, overshadowed the hack Paras win in the sense that, you know, while he did, you know, have a loss... He showed toughness and resilience that is going to be very, very valued, valuable to him in the UFC moving forward. I think invaluable is probably a better word, honestly. Yeah, but that moves Hack Parast 7-4 in the UFC, 4-2 and two in his last six. Nat and his last out. six fights have all gone to the scorecard. So that seems to be the way he wins fights. Not a dig. That just seems the way he has found the most success in the UFC. 